Good evening. Welcome to the Billy Wilder Theatre at the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs and Education, and I am very, very excited to introduce tonight's program, which is an extreme sort of dialogue between Elizabeth Streb and Philippe Petit. Elizabeth Streb is a physicist who experiments with gravity, movement, and flight. Simultaneously, she's an artist and a choreographer, athlete, and a stuntwoman who tests the potential of the human body to the extreme. In 1985, she founded the Streb Extreme Action Company, Streak, <laughs> which performs in the US and internationally. And I'm not the only one who thinks that she's a genius. In 1998, I believe, she was awarded a genius grant from the MacArthur Foundation, well-deserved. Um, and then in 2003, she founded SLAM, AKA the Streb Lab for Action Mechanics. Uh, her new book is Streb, How to Become an Extreme Action Hero, and we hope that you'll take a moment to join Elizabeth out in the lobby. We'll have a book signing after today's talk. Philippe Petit is the French high-wire artist who gained fame for his high-wire at walk between the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center on August 7th, 1974. The extraordinary feat was chronicled in the 2008 Academy Award-winning documentary Man on Wire, um, based on Petit's memoir, To Reach the Clouds. So first we're gonna have Elizabeth um, out and then she'll bring Philippe in in a little while. So please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Streb. Thank you. This is how the whole thing begins. This song probably gives you a really good bit of evidence about what my generation was. And in uh, 1972, uh, I got on my Honda 350. That's me in 1972. Do you see any resemblance whatsoever? No. But when I was a kid growing up in Penfield, New York, which is just outside of Rochester, my, my sister got in a lot of trouble by always going with guys that had motorcycles. And I listened outside and I heard the five gears. And for me, that was amalgam of freedom. I thought, that's freedom and that's gonna take me out of this horse town. I'm gonna ride my Honda all the way across, across the good old USA. And I ended up, um, I was pretty much an action specialist all through my childhood, but in a very errant, kind of eccentric way. I would do things like see a bunch of, a gaggle of men standing around at the marina, looking down, and uh, I think, I wonder what they're looking at. I was about 10, and I'd push through them, and I realized, oh, they're looking at an eel wiggling all over that had swallowed a hook. Now, because I was a professional fisher person at age 10, I just bent down, I stuck my entire hand down the gullet of the eel, got my finger on the stem of the hook and pushed down, released it from its stomach, and uh, out came the hook. Now, if you're, if you're into fishing, you know that it's a drag when an eel swallows your rig. I can see that not many people in LA fish. <laughs> anyway, never mind. So I decided that for many reasons, I went downhill skiing, I rode my motorcycle as fast as I could before the wheels came off the ground. That was 90 miles an hour for a Honda 350, which, uh, which most of you must know, that's a very small bike. I, I did baseball, basketball, and when I was 17, I went to Our Lady of Mercy High School. When I was 17, you had to figure out what you wanted to do. So I went to SUNY Brockport, they gave you a list, and I also thought of myself as an artist because I could draw. And I, of course, was an action specialist at that time. So when I came across the word dance, I thought, that's me, even though my friends did not think that I had any credentials whatsoever, which was true. I, could, I didn't know what a plie was. But in 1972, when I had graduated, gotten my degree in modern dance, much to the dismay of many of the people in the dance program, I hopped on my motorcycle and headed out in an easy rider sort of way, heading to New Orleans, which was foolish, but that's what they did in the movie. I was really on my way to San Francisco. So 6,000 miles and 30 days later, I ended up in San Francisco with about 80 bucks and I started my life. My heroes when I was growing up, because I was from a very, very working class family. My adopted dad was a Mason, my mom was a housewife. 
and she taught me how to be kind, not gossip, and um, think about what I wanted to do with my life. I was obsessed with motion, and so I was trying to figure out, wow, no one around me spends their time making up moves. So I saw no model exactly for how do you uh, attach your life, your life dream, uh, e economically to a move. My heroes um, were Houdini, since we didn't go to fancy dance concerts. Um, certainly, we were very close to Niagara, the Niagara Falls, the people who would smash themselves into a barrel and go over the falls. I, I still want to do that. I think you should always do one really extreme move before the lights go out. So far, that's really um, in, the high, in the, high, the very high list of what I might want to do. Shipwreck Kelly. Um, my project, basically, as I lur lurched forward through my 20s, um, was really more of an anthropologist. I really wanted to collect these moves that happened in the world that every human would comprehend, that had to do with not just accidents, but labor, had to do with things that people like Evil Knievel would uh, attempt, like how, how uh, when he was asked, you know, would you do anything different towards the end of his life, he'd say, well, maybe I would have gone faster on a couple of the jumps. He was not a scientist. But he said, and I thought this was so profound, I never had any trouble with a takeoff. It's a landing that's a problem. I found that to be true. Of course, my major hero, as I went on in life, uh, Trisha Brown became my hero. But I didn't know these people when I was well growing up. Aspects of the Higgs ocean. Um, the to notion of what it meant to fly, which is what I thought was missing Larry from modern dance, was something that I thought no one had ever tried as a human being before. And there were lots of different examples of flight if you weren't thinking of small, light-boned birds. He dreamt of flying in his own homemade machine. In 1982, at age 33, he attached 42 weather balloons to a plastic lawn chair, tethered the contraption to his Chevrolet, then sat himself in the chair, untied the ropes, and rose. Not 30 feet, not 40 not 100 as he imagined. Above his girlfriend, his mother, and the family's suburban ranch house, Larry rose 16,000 feet over Los Angeles with not even a seatbelt on his chair. <laughs> a few miles out to sea, a startled commuter pilot saw Larry pass his cockpit. An alerted rescue helicopter at last towed Larry home, but Larry was already saved. To fly was all he wanted. After Larry landed, his arresting officer asked him why he'd done it. He was curious, said Larry. Besides, a man can't just sit around. When I would hear stories like this, this, this story for Larry got him through Vietnam. He had a dream of flight that no one had ever done before. And he just kept trying to figure out how he could accomplish it. And I, I was never so moved as when I read this in the Darwin Award. You know what the Darwin Awards are? Usually you have to die to get in that book. He was one of the few people who didn't die doing a stupid human trick. As Streb, as, as, as an idea, I thought I wanted to fly with bodies. And I realized as I went through all of my dance training and continued to through my middle 40s, I'm 60 now, so I stopped, about, stopped taking ballet classes, etc at about 45, I, I started to gather a bunch of questions and um, slight arguments about why dancers spend all their time on the bottom of their feet. Why don't they land on different bases? Why do they always kind of jump off their feet and come back to their feet? Why do they look in the mirror? Why do they use music? Why don't they try to do something that includes the failure of flight, which would be impact? So I started to um, decide that to tell the truth with motion was my job. That I wanted, this is from Wolf Trap a few years ago and they commissioned Streb to honor the Wright brothers in, on their 100th anniversary of flight. Um, what I was trying to do, and I had been experimenting for a number of years with just staying in the air longer, falling up or more slowly down. And I decided to call this Wild Blue Yonder, and many of you in the audience, you probably know, this is the national anthem for the Air Force, which my, my girlfriend, Laura Flanders, hardly talked to me after this. But 
When this was presented at Wolf Trap, every Tuskegee Airman in the audience stood up with his hand on his heart. And in my research for flight, manned flight on a machine, I realized, wow, the, the military is the investor in this. Whatever use they, they put it to, which was really punitive and pugilistic, I, I was surprised to see that these phenomenal inventions happened, um, mostly from the military. So I was trying to honor what would that 12 seconds of consistent flight look like. The other question that Streb asked, many questions, what are the neurological heart-stopping moments of action? If I could locate them and put them on stage, first, I really believe they had to be extreme. Is it falling? Are they durational? What if modern dance thinks, you know, you're choreographing to music, the score is 20, 30, 40 minutes, the dance, therefore, is 20, 30, 40 minutes? What if it's true that really action is episodic? This is me diving through glass in 1997. It was one of my more exciting moves. And I was trying to show the effect of action on substance. So we collected at Streb a bunch of abrupt, intense actions that when you watch them in the audience, this is slam and there's a bunch of kids in our kids ac action class. They're my barometer, really. Now, audiences or my dance cohorts might be taking notes saying, wow, that's so violent. Now, the kids are so excited because they must spend a lot of their time slamming into walls. But we don't say we're slamming into walls. We say we're doing an extreme move that is the edge of our space and it stops us. I try to take objects from the world of construction. This is an I-beam. And I attempt to have it move the way it moves. We hung it from a cable that's attached to a motorized cross truss. And um, <clears throat> when it revolves laterally, depending on what height it is or is not off the ground, it's such a pure way to designate space. Rather than saying, oh, I think I'll, I think I'll uh, do this over here, and then when I'm done over here, I'll go over there. This is an urgent, insistent way. In my investigation of how to tell the truth about a physical motion, this is more or less a, strict, a spatial trompe l'oeil. It's a little lighter, calmer than the others. But the dancers are doing moves on a frictionless surface, being projected on a vertical surface with a surveillance camera from above. What we try to do is construct a Matrix One-like kind of thing where you know you couldn't really have your friend up here above your head and turn them. Not really, but almost. You can almost understand what the physical possibilities would be. And then we took these ideas and tried to do them vertically, and so far that has not happened. I have a thought that what Streb is going towards is to construct what we think is a missing uh, format for theatricality. We call it a movicle. And my dream would be able to be to present something that is about subject as action, not object as body. And how can we figure out how to get every one of these moves and all of this 15 tons of equipment into one place at the same time. Asking questions about grammar, physical grammar. Wondering if joints are actions verbs. Deconstructing the use of the body, not in the balletic Baroque manner, so you know you have a knee, so therefore you'll do a developé or an arm, so okay, I'm gonna do a port de bras That's not a good enough reason to flail your limbs around, in my opinion. But if you extracted the body itself from what its function is, what could it, what it, what could it um, mimic to the people watching, and what kind of moves could it do? What if it's what it's doing and not the body itself? And what you're really trying to see is how it goes through space. 
So all of the other devices that I noticed I didn't think were being employed by the dance world, which is proportion, frame of reference, angle of view, were always competing with the great outside, asking what actions vanishing point might be. I think the visual art concluded in the 15th century, I think. Annie, is that true? She's not going to answer. Um, that, it, that it perhaps was the vanishing point. They figured that out. What if, what if you thought you looked at this perceptually and decided, well, there's a little man going out of a young boy's head? But we know, but only because of intellectual issues, that that's not true. So what I'm trying to do is how can I put on stage with this limited area with a body and action and space and time an event that you would understand immediately physically. It would skip your brain and go right to your gut and you would feel that it had happened to you and that you had actually had an experience. Um, the circus decided that their arena, and I think dance has plopped themselves onto arenas without question, that the diameter of this circle, for instance, had to be uh, 22 feet wide so that the horse running around uh, could hold a person standing up. I thought that was so beautiful. Wow, there's utility to the decision of the size of their platform. Corbusier talks about the golden mean, the golden ratio, and how the scale of the human depicts certain things that are true all through uh, biology and the world and nature and our physicality. And when you perceive motion, which has become a real part of my investigation now, um, is, 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 is something that's invisible and how can you possibly spot it? So if that's true and it's invisible and it hasn't happened yet or it just happened, it's not there, it's gone, um, I think there's just many, many unanswered questions. These are a list of questions we've asked over the years. It's interesting to take a look at all the things that we thought were just never going to be possible and are now. And I keep thinking, well, let's make a list now. And I just wonder in 30 years what's going to be possible that isn't something we can even think about right now. Um, can you think of something? I wish I could make a move that if you saw it, you would be so shocked simply because you'd never seen that move before. So when we go into the studio, we really start to ask a question that seems absurd, that seems so unquestionably true you wouldn't even think to ask it, and then come up with something just purely out of discovery that ends up being an idea or a physical moment that never ever would have occurred if the question weren't as absurd as it was. Um, about 10 years ago, and finally, um, I was almost gonna get a show on, on a commercial show on Broadway, and Ken Feld came to our rehearsals and said, you know, you're missing, a Ken Feld owns Ringling Brother Barnum & Bailey Circus. He said, you're really, you're really missing something. I need, I need little people and elephants in the show. So I talked to David, who owns Circus Flora, and this is Flora, and I said, could I teach Flora, because I've made trampoline dances, to do the trampoline? He said, well, it's really hard to teach elephants to climb, and it's hard, they don't plie. And all of this, and uh, you know, while, while I was going through all of this, nobody told me they eat th 300 pounds of food a day, which I want to say is more food than eight dancers eat a day. But I was so sure that if I could get this dance with this elephant, I would be able to really, um, you know, be produced by Ken Feld. It just ended up being just simply too impractical. Um, danger is a part of what we do. Um, that's blaze away. I tried to put a fire out once for my girlfriend for her 40th birthday and I forgot I had put sterno all over me and I stood up and I was on fire. Another very exciting moment in my life. Um, I look out into the world at turbulence and I wonder if that eight seconds of hell on the back of a bowl is something we could bring into the studio constructively somehow. What is the formula for turbulence, for impact? We have to invent I machines. Strategy. Right now, this is the bottom of our stage. We turn our floor. 
So we invented a turning machine, but with very, very high-powered motors. So uh, if you guys come to our studio at Slam in Brooklyn, New York, I'll let you walk across the stage, and you'll just go flying. But I'll make sure I tie you on to something uh, so that nothing happens to you. Our equipment, we think, is very much like the musical instruments that the orchestras started to build before they were orchestras, the harpsichord, the flute, when they decided sometime back in the middle centuries that the human voice was not sufficient to express everything that a body could express with their voice. So they started making things. And I really do believe that action is only enacted by special equipment that allows you to access the air above you. We're asking questions about how people are gonna gather in this century and trying to change, change the rules of conduct. Hi, and this Rob, is my this is one minute message to Obama. I'm an extreme action choreographer in New York City and wanted to weigh in on the easiest, cheapest way to change our world. We choreographers whose stock and trade are invisible things, i.e. movement, have an extremely affordable plan to establish the bedrock of your platform for governance. I know you need to fix the economy, end war, create new jobs, and improve education and health. If you establish movement as a holy elixir for our daily lives, I predict all above would come to pass. Movement is a panacea we've all been searching for. Not a movement, but humans doing movement. Action as subject. Here's the plan laid out simply. I.e., every morning, before coffee, all 300 million people in the USA would jump up and down three times, then do a full 360 turn in the air, and snap into a huge axe with their body vertically. If you inaugurate this movement policy, I predict, wars will end, sadnesses will cease, and the need for Ritalin will disappear. Congratulations, and call if you need more information. Thanks for your leadership, Elizabeth Streb. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to You can try that when you come to the studio as well. Or you can just put one up in your house. It really works. It is my pleasure to introduce a man whose tracks and pathways still are etched between our beloved Phantom Towers and in our hearts. Please help me welcome the extravagantly brave and magical maestro of the impossible act, Philippe Petit. Mm. What do you think? A lot of things. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Go for it. Well, I, I, it's very strange because part of you is me. When you talk, and I, I almost hear myself, uh, not all the time, but a lot of things <laughs> you say, I, I go right to my heart. I, I love the, the cows that you seem to uh, welcome and somehow uh, change into a form of art. And I, love, I like to hear every two seconds the word decision. Um, and, and, you know, living through art is a daily fight. We all know that. And uh, to wake up in the morning, I love this jumping human X. Um, no, no, but, but we are here to make a conversation, right? So don't ask me to do a monologue. Oh, oh no, I got, lots of I got lots of questions, definitely. Definitely. Well, um, have you ever uh, thought about, I mean, I think we quantify what we do differently. Philippe, have you ever thought about that what you do is extreme, extreme, extreme movement, particularly? You know, when I came to this country uh, millions of years ago uh, with the fixed idea of putting a wire between the building, my English was very poor, and I didn't hear that, that word. And uh, now for the past, I don't know, 10, 15 years, I hear it all the time, and I have a big problem with it because people, um, what I do 
um, in my own way of thinking, cannot be put into the uh, adventure of the ac extreme and, and, you know, get a rush of adrenaline and all those extreme sports. And so extreme, extreme, I'm very tired of that. But of course, what, what I do must be extreme because, they, you know, uh, uh <laughs> I, <laughs> I walk, yes, uh, long and high path uh, in the sky. So I should smile uh, with bienveillance, you know which means being nice to the person talking. Thank you, uh, thank you. When they say <laughs> what you do is extreme, and I say fine, but no, I, to me, well, you know, you cannot say poetry is extreme. I mean, you can say it's exquisite, you can say it's, it's, a, it's, it's um, enigmatic, but I, I don't know. Um, so I don't know, that's the answer to your question. Well, can I, can I push it a little? Oh, push me twice. Push me. you twice. Okay. <laughs> I know I tried to push him once off the wire. That didn't ha ha happen at all. Oh, you'll have to tell that story. I have to way. tell that yeah. story. Absolutely. Um, this is what I want to like. Um, we're announcing also uh, not just the publication of my book, which I hope you all will get it because then you'll know how to be an extreme action hero. But uh, I have stalked Philippe Petit from August 7th, 1974 till. Well, I'm still stalking you, really. But you know, right there, <laughs> I want to interject. It's impossible to stalk me because I am a little survivor rat. And in life, I walk and I look over my shoulder to see if I am being followed. So how but, come but, I didn't catch you? Well, I'm very sneaky. I was extremely sneaky. In fact, in fact, I think you knew someone in a building that I lived in at 178 West Houston Street in New York City. And uh, after the walk... You know, because I also saw you in the chalk circles, you know, doing this phenomenal movement. Uh, um, she's mentioning that I am a street juggler and I draw a circle of chalk and I don't speak and I juggle and I pickpocket and I do magic. That was a little parenthesis. <laughs> <laughs> um, and every so often I'd be coming out of my building uh, and Philippe would run up by me. And, I, and w our shoulders wouldn't brush or anything. The, 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 the hallway was about this wide, but still... He'd be gone, and I'd just sit down and go, oh, my gosh, that's him. And so I was stalking you. I knew where you were, and our paths happened to cross. And you came a thousand times, unbeknownst to me, yeah. to my circle of chalk. Yeah. Did you give me some money? Well, I didn't have, no. I, <laughs> she doesn't remember. It's a really good question, but I was, I didn't have any back then. I didn't? No. Well, no, I had 15 maxed out credit cards, though. No. I can't believe I wouldn't give you money, Philippe. Let's not let that get between us somehow. Um, this is my question. So it's about, it's about, I'm thinking in a different way, and I think the vernaculars are different, and, and interestingly different, that if things are not extreme in a theatrical sense, because my space is on stage, and I'm, I'm forced into the proscenium, because that's where my economy is, uh, no one will notice it as action. They'll think, oh, what a pretty body, oh, nice music, oh, it's about a relationship. And I say extreme because I want to push the, the, the extreme reality of what a real move is to the upper quadrant so that people cannot do anything but think of it as extreme. But if yours is not qualified like that, what if, because when we were building the wire that's at Streb right now, you, you almost said, said, oh, it's too low to do a performance on. Like, rigging the wire. The what? Building the wire, rigging Bu the wire. Rigging, what did I say? Building. I'm sorry. Rigging the wire. <laughs> At SLAM, Streb Lab for Action Mechanics, there is a brand new Philippe Petit tightrope. And it is so exquisite. And it comes with a 50-page book, which are the designs over really since 2007, when we started to talk about this. You started making drawings and measuring. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking maybe if my technical director... That was not the question, so I didn't... I know, to... I know, no, I know. Um, but anyway... Why wouldn't a low wire be something that you would do a presentation on? Ah, um, it's because I, I, my life is in the sky. It doesn't have to be the highest and widest sky, but the definition of the sky for four years old is it's something where you look up because we are glued to the ground, and it's something that is unattainable. You see plane, you see birds, uh, and you want to fly. Everybody wants to fly. So the sky is... is, is um, is, is a continent that we have to discover, explore. And, well, here it's a beautiful theater, but it's almost too small to, to try to represent the sky, although exceptions can be made. I'm a man of exceptions. So in your fabulous space in Brooklyn, where I will do this uh, workshop, this masterclass very soon, you know, 
uh, talk about it. Um, the Y is 10 feet high and, uh, you know, and, and 40 feet long, and it's perfect for learning and for practicing. Um, but to do a performance there with a balancing pole, you know, banging into the lights, and uh, it's, it's very terrestrial. It will be sad in a way, although for a movie scene, uh, things like that can be done. That's now my, my exception list. For example, I dream for years, but it's a movie in a way, a scene in a movie, like we take the, the most beautiful cave in the world, you know? And then it's a symbol of absence of space. You are in the middle of the earth, the stalactite and stalagmites, and uh, you're there uh, with, with 30,000 candles, like Milos Forman lit in Amelius, you know, the Prague theater, and you have a, a classic uh, quintet, and suddenly, out of nowhere, in this little space that is minuscule, you have an apparition, a man, a woman, on the wire, which suddenly create that little obscure box, become the sky, become the universe. So you see, exceptions are very important um, to prove that the rule <laughs> should be broken. So anyway, this little practice wire in which uh, I'm going to teach people, on which I'm going to teach people to walk, I, I would not do a performance on it. But that was my uh, direct reaction to your question. Right. When you asked me, you, could you do uh, after your master class, maybe soon a, a show? I said, no, never, it's ridiculous. But if you insist a little bit and stalk me, <laughs> you know, a little bit more. I might agree because then it's a matter of, of directing, theatrical directing. You you can make you can make uh, space into a little box. I mean, I I, I go I, I go in many yeah. directions because that's my speciality. And and good luck if you uh, if you <laughs> hold your thread. You know, for example, you have to talk about the workshop and all yeah, that. Yeah, I know. I can but do it. good luck. I I would be <laughs> lost. But anyway, I want to make another little. Um, metaphor or description of an exception. One of the most, as a wire walker, one of the most, Im most beautiful image I have in my, in my life, as a, I am a movie maker who has not done his first movie yet, is in the south of France. I was hitchhiking. I was a young wire walker, 18 years old, and there was a little circus, very poor circus. It's called Palk, and they don't even have a tent. They have two poles, and, and there was a minuscule little cable uh, 15 feet off the ground, and suddenly, an obese wire walker start walking on it. And it was one of the most beautiful <laughs> things I ever saw in my life. Like fat, fat Yeah, guy? no, no, fat, fat, Malon Brando. Oh. Um, <laughs> and it was light, and it was, and it was suddenly an image of contradiction. It was a, a Rubanesque mass, and yet this human body was cutting space sharply with a knife of its, of its, of its motion, and, uh, you know, it's, it's um, what am I saying all that? I don't know, just to, to praise uh, extreme contradiction and exceptions. Oh. Next question. Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I keep, I mean, I do, you can imagine, if you were me, and, and you had, I mean, this is um, an imprimatur, Philippe's tightrope, because we went to the Bilco Wire Factory in New Jersey. Remember, you, you've got to come to the Bilco Wire Factory in New Jersey. We're choosing our wire tomorrow. I'm like, the what? You don't know. Well, first, New Jersey, you sure? No. Um, but I went there, and you can't imagine. I mean, Philippe, of course, taught himself engineering. How else could you have rigged that wire across the World Trade Towers? How else? And in our small studio, I watched, and I don't know whether it's a similar kind of magic, but I watched the most extraordinary system of measurements occur to build that wire. And it is one to of rig. the- To rig. Oh, man. To rig that wire. And it is one of the most beautiful things that I've ever seen. And so I couldn't help thinking that, uh, that you would perform on it. You know, that, that's where that came from. And so you can see this is a form of my stalking. Maybe, you know, I don't know. I, I don't want you to get obese. I'm not saying that. But if that's the only way that it would make it beautiful. Um, do you think... A question. <laughs> What is the first real move, I mean, I know that's my vernacular, that you remember paying attention to as a child? Well, four years old, I am in a sandbox, and I'm taking, making my little road for my little car very seriously. I cannot uh, speak or play with the other kids because their little streets are lousy and the car fall off. And, um, and I am being called, and the voice is, my mother, it's time to, to come to dinner. And, this is a ridiculous loss of time. I'm four years old. I need to perfect my words. And that's the story of my life. It started early, but um, then at six years old, I learned magic by myself. 
And uh, as an idiot, I, I, uh, I took uh, six years old. My hands are very small for, for the big cars. And uh, of course, at the time, there were no uh, videotapes and no you know, uh, uh, workshops from uh, magicians. So I had um, a book from uh, the 1900 with engravings. I mean, imagine he's six years old, and instead of, of just going to school uh, on the first day, I get my little magic box and say to a kid, uh, take a card. I actually try to make sense of the instruction, work in front of the mirror. Imagine a six, six years old kid working in front of the mirror. And I, I can show you because the- Do you have the, a card, you no, have no, a card the, with you? Oh. The, well, I always, uh, you know, always, you're, you're, well, anyway, well, no, but the, no, 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 that's just the, the preamble. You have to wake up the car so the car knows its way. But no, no, I show you, this is not to entertain you. I'm not here to entertain you. This is to prove a point that the first um, uh, manipulation that I learned uh, from six years old, it took me four years to learn it well, was to make a card disappear, right? And actually, it's, it's still there, of course. And I wouldn't show you there because, you know, you don't show magic. But I can tell you there are seven moves. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And you see, when I do it slowly in the front row, you can see the card shows. It's not perfect. So six years old, I learned that. And there were 12 pages in my little book printed in 1903 engravings. And I work in the mirror. And then, I don't know, six months later, I do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And it looks pretty good in the mirror. And I'm not cheating. The card is still there. Oh, I shouldn't show because it's magic. But OK. And then a year passed. And they say to do that in two seconds is, a, is a, the work of an amateur. So then I cannot, with my mouse, count as fast as my finger do the move. I cannot say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, two, two. you know, it's already gone. And one second, I think, OK, I'm getting there, but it's nothing. You have to do this move in a quarter of a second, and it should be absolutely perfect. And the card is still there. So that's, again, the story of my life. This, you know. Um, Oh, by the way, by the way, talking about magic, I have to salute a friend and a great artist who is here tonight. He's a master of, of, of deception, a great magician, a historian of magic, Ricky J. Ricky, are you there? Oh, okay. So. <laughs> Something I was always wondering, uh, um, the sleight of hand, if you call that sleight of hand. Could you do a sleight of hand do you believe it's physically possible to do a sleight of hand with the entire body? But you see, physicality has nothing to do with it. You don't, I mean, you don't that's, think so? That's what separates good and bad magicians. You can work your whole life on a magic trick and do it so physically, so, so um, automatically, uh, as you say, robotically, that you will not create magic. So magic is a very, magic and, and all the art, it's a very strange chemistry that hardly could be put in recipes, you know? It's not like making an omelette. It's a... It's a perfect mingling of the body and the, and the soul. So when you see uh, Barry Shnikov do his uh, you know, 12 pirouettes for 12 rubles in uh, White Nights, um, it's, it's thousands of hours of work. But it's also his soul has to be, has to be devilishly uplifted so he can fly for a few seconds, you know? Um, I know, I know Bali is, is not uh, the, you know, the closest thing in your heart, but... Uh, but this is an, an example that I cannot... Um, I am going to teach the theater of balance, the high wire, and in this uh, new in my life, first time in my life after years of being stalked by you. <laughs> um, and I, am, I cannot talk technically about it. it yes, I will. I will uh, say, you know, do this, do that. But actually, the best way to teach an art is not to tell, is to let the student discover. So actually, now what I'm saying is that the best school is a school that I followed. I was thrown out of five schools when I was a kid. Why? Because I wanted to follow the school of life, and I learned. It might be false or presumptuous to say it, but I feel I have learned all my arts, all my language, all my engineering by myself. And actually, it's, it's true. So the best school is learn by yourself. Now, of course, the great teacher is the person who almost says nothing. You see, who opens doors and hears the student and the door is open and, oh, it smells interesting, let's go, let's make mistakes, let, and, and let's, let's work. So, why am I talking like well, that about... You, well, this is... The, I mean, I still have no, this... No, hold on. I, I want to answer your question. Oh, you were talking about... Well, I was talking about... Move. You're, can't, you're saying you can't say the words as fast as you can move. Yeah, the, right? the, the, the tongue So, so the body, the mind, is slower than the body. No, well, hold on. This is, this is complicated. But what if it's not just uh, the hand, asking me to talk body? about, because, yes, we're now... Um, um, decortique, how do you say... Uh, 
uh, when, when you cut some, some animal, what is dissect. it? Dissect. Dissect. We're now dissecting something that should not be dissected, dissected, because actually, again, if we go into the subject of that manipulation, right, where the hand seems to go faster than the eyes or than the mouth, actually, it's not entirely technical. You have to have a kind of a, you, you, you have to present it. Actually, the hand moves, you know, if you, if you study it, if you do it completely still, it's not the same, but the hands move, it's a kind of illusion. That, uh, and, and right there, I am floating, it's a matter of breathing, it's a matter of occupying space, where do you do it? Uh, it's a matter of timing, and all the arts have that. So you, you cannot call that the, the, the creating of a, of a ephemeral um, theatrical uh, place. Um, you cannot call that a technique. It's really a mix of... Uh, of, of the feeling of the artist, and then, yes, millions of hours of, of work. But, but see, my, f my obsession is motion, and my obsession is wanting to know um, how fast can the body move well before it disappears? Because what a move would that be, right? Wouldn't that I be made, beautiful? I made the Watch this. No, I'm gone. I oh. made the Dalai Lama uh, last week at my cathedral where I'm artist in residence for the past 28 years, um, Saint John the Divine in New York City. And everybody was going there saying, I'm going to get my answer. And there was a QA and a and they asked questions. And half of the time he said with a big smile, I don't know. That's annoying. So I am not a, You're doing a, that. I'm not a guru. I am not a wise man. I am actually an imbecile, you know. I am a guy who, who continues to cling to um, the child in me. And I, I keep running toward precipices. Uh, uh, of, uh, that, and, and I make a lot of mistakes. I love making mistakes because you learn much more from your mistake than from the kudos. You know, you're a great artist. Well, thank you. But this was this was very bad. Ah, now thank you. That I'm going to learn from your critic. So anyway, uh, you see, I still I, I lost the question. It doesn't well, matter. that's okay. But I mean, I, 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 this is my method. I'll ask the question go, three go times back, and then he won't answer go it. Go back to I, what I have you a really good question. Me. Yeah, oh, about movement or what? Well, I, I think that. I mean, of course, I came from the dance world where you had to repeat those moves thousands and thousands of times. I'm standing because I got sick of sitting. Do you want to stand? When I will want to stand, <laughs> you will see me standing. Um, and so training technique, as some of you in the audience know, um, are certain moves that are prescribed, and you do them in order, and you know the 32 uh, Fuertes on point, or the whatever Brezhnikov was doing, it works. And yes, the soul and all that has to make you care about hey, watching hey, the person please, do it. Please, please, the oh, soul and all that. The soul, don't, don't minimize and don't step on the soul with your big black boots. Uh, no, I... <laughs> well, yeah, but, you know, if you're in a field like I have been for so many years called dance, um, our, our, our kind of, uh, our, I mean, in a certain way, in a certain way, I mean, you'd have to say you're a classicist, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I and am in a, a certain way, I'm the opposite of that. I love tools. I love to sharpen my own tools. Of course, I, I build tools to make tools. Uh, but I, I love craftsmanship. I love the, the, the sculptor who made the, the Gothic cathedral. I love what we don't see anymore. I love people spending hours doing something and being proud of their creation. I mean, show me somebody who is proud. You ask me to wash a window, I'm going to wash the window impeccably. And I'm going to look back up and smile because I did a good job and now I'm happy. But so I am a mad man, I'm beautiful. sorry. But I mean, it's beautiful, but I found in, in, in trying to figure out how to invent a move that, let's say, no one's done before, whether it's the thing itself, the move itself, which is physically done by the body but invisible, or the actual uh, invisible part of it. Like, let's say there's a move that no one's ever seen before. Let's say no one's ever fallen from 30 feet onto their stomachs, the no, way we falling do. Falling is not my speciality. Oh, <laughs> No, so this, is, this is a dialectic, right? No, I know. It's my specialty because I believe that humans spend a lot of time being careful, especially dancers, uh, not getting hurt. So my, question, my next question to you is, what is the role of risk or chance in what you do? But you see, risk, again, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dirty word. Um, why? Because why? you think you do risk, Philippe. No, 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 no. You see that? Man? Hold on. I... Uh, this is crazy because actually since um, I am a dot in the sky, 
right, most of the time, and people point at the madman, and I wouldn't do it, and he's going to die, and, you know, how can you live an entire life of risk? Well, let me tell you, and, and you, you have no right to tell me that it is not the case, because I'm telling you how I am and how I feel. Um, I never take risks. I think it's obscene to cross the street without looking left and right for the bus. You are, you're an idiot, and you deserve to die. Well, what if it's a... <laughs> So, what no, if it's on. a one-way street? So then why would you look so two ways? So we should define the risk, but there is a beautiful risk, which I'm trying to take every day when I wake up, is the intellectual risk. The risk of not, for an artist, you know, or, or the art of life, it doesn't matter, to fall comfortably in the armchair of success. I'm a painter, this type of painting sell all my life. I'm now painting this little duplicate. I'm not an artist, I'm a zombie, right? So that's, that's security. So for any artist, I think you have to be on the edge, it's, uh, it's not a pun, and you have to risk, intellectually risking, you have to try, you have to make mistakes, you have to make a fool of yourself, and, and let, let the people laugh at you, but you have to be every day thinking, this, this little miserable 24 hours is a continent, what I'm going to do? Oh my God, I have to write my new book, I have to practice my magic, I have to spend three hours on the highway every day practicing, I have to... So, the hours, the days are not long enough, and you have to risk breaking your rules of, okay, well, I'm going to spend three days working on this magic trick, and then I will finish my book, or because, and, and it's tumultuous, and it's, it's ridiculous, it's a giant mess, and that's what I think the art of living should be. And right there, I am in a way describing the intellectual risk, which I really praise. But to, uh, for, for a wire walker to not verify the anchor point before a performance, which happens most of the time in the circus, and I was so happy I was not born in the circus, is something un unfathomable for me. Because then you, you put your life in jeopardy. For a wire walker before a walk to say, well, I hope it's strong enough and I will make it. This is, this is more than, this is obscene, like my friend Werner Herzog would say, hold on, hold on, hold on. So now what I do, and this is an answer to your question about, about risk. Um, first, I spend months and months, if I had, you know, my own slideshow, I will show you how I prepare for a walk. It's months and months, and it's completely crazy. <laughs> I study the weather, and I, anyway. But now when, when the, the time comes to grab the pole in front of, you know, 100,000 people and start walking on the wire, I am not thinking. I hope to do that last step and to have a nice dinner with my friends. I know I will. If not, I will not do the first step. I will run away like a coward and hide myself and kill myself. <laughs> so um, so I, I, I don't take risks. When, when a rope is not rightly fastened, I don't start my show. I, I, well, it doesn't happen, but when I was young, I would come and repair the, the mistake or make it better. Then I will... Because you see, my answer, it's, it's, it's a line that I throw at you, is that I am not um, chancing my life when I walk on a wire. I do something very beautiful and noble, which is I am carrying my life across. And everybody can do that, but it, it, it takes intellectual courage. Um, that, that's completely beautiful and profound. And, and again, I think we live in totally different worlds because if you are physically in your comfort zone, um, for me, getting out of your comfort zone is really the only place you can grab any kind of uh, new move. You have to risk getting hurt in a zone that you've never uh, physically been in before. Um, I think that it's different for you, but um, you know, on the other hand, I don't think you're planning to become a modern dancer anytime soon. Is that true? You, you don't have big black boots. You have lovely black boots. Thank you. That's so sweet of you. <laughs> okay, so just um, before we open it up, I hope you're collecting your questions here. I wanted oh, yes, to yes. ask... We, we are going to throw the ball to right the audience. Now. We right? are in one second, but okay, I think we, we, we have still time. have a moment. You're, you're in control of time. I am so I am in control. I am totally out of control right. of time. I'm, I'm, judge I'm, okay. I'm totally with you. So uh, some more questions? Yes. Just one more to you, just one more to you. Are there any walks? Um, and again, I've read uh, so many of your books and I've also read apocryphal stories of you, so. You, you're a fan. I am a fan. I've been a fan for many, many years and I, and I still am a fan. Um, do you want to show them how we no, walked no, no, across no, the wire together? No, let me it, ask hold this on. one. No, no, let, let me, me interrupt this. you. This, this is my oh, speciality. This is such a good question. To interrupt. I want to say it's amazing because I am pulling you by the sleeve, left and right. I'm sending you in all kinds of directions. 
completely bother you and interrupt you, and you never um, lose the thread, the wire, Thank the you. hope Thank of you. your presentation. Yeah, so no, no. I am quite uh, impressed. So what was the well, question? Well, a lot of that, a lot of that is because I'm I'm curious, deeply curious, and a lot of times when we spend together, I don't get a chance to ask uh, the questions. Here it is. I heard once. There's two parts of it. I heard once that you were planning a walk across the Grand Canyon, and I don't think you were ever planning a walk across uh, Niagara Falls, Horseshoe Falls. Okay. I, I wanted I, to know, I, are you planning to do one of those two? No, no, no. Well, this is bothering because when I came to this country after the World Trade Center, uh, freshly after the World Trade Center uh, walk, I heard always the same question. Hey, you know what you should do? You should walk in the Grand Canyon. And then Niagara Falls, you know, you should cross Niagara Falls. And I was so tired to hear Canyon, 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 Grand Canyon, and Niagara Falls. But of course... And I've just asked you again. Uh, uh, no, no, but I, I tell you now my reaction. Um, of course, from the moment I started even in France at uh, 14, 15 to learn by myself the high wire, right there people say, oh, you want to become a wire walker? You know what you should do one day is walk over Niagara Falls or walk <laughs> over the Grand Canyon. Even the French, who are usually very narrow-minded and only see the, their little village at the center of the universe, um, <laughs> talked about um, those places. So I came... Because only in America are those okay, places. So I'm going to keep it short so we have a uh, question and answer with the audience. But So I came here, I did this work, and then now again I have those damn words coming to me. So of course I investigate it, and I find out that um, the Grand Canyon, which is in a park department of America, they do not want any artist to play in their backyard. They, they, even the greatest proposal, they throw it without reading, okay? But, but I discover that there is a magnificent canyon in the Grand Canyon that is a private property. It's the Navajo Nation. And I went there and I find a place that was like, what, 15 years ago, where I, I would put the wire and it was higher than the Twin Towers with its antenna. Right? And it was a, I, I wrote an opera in the Grand Canyon, and the Navajo, my brothers, were going to be part of the show, um, share with humanity through all the media and all that, um, with their music and with their celebration and their costume and, their, um, and, and their, their civilization, their life, their culture. So it was a beautiful thing. But my producers at the time um, got scared. They came to the edge of the canyon, and they look, and they say, but Hold on, my, my mic is falling off because I moved too much. Um, <laughs> and, and they said, uh, oh my God, we are paying Philip to kill himself. <gasps> you know, and they withdraw. So anyway, um, and, but at the moment, this project, I refuse to put it in a little box, a uh, label dead project, you know. Uh, it's still alive, but it will take really an angel of the art to write the, the check with quite a few zeros. How much do you need? Um, I, I don't know, four or five million dollars, less than a rock, uh, a rock concert, you know, by the, by the Stones. Okay. Um, but anyway, um, so now Niagara Falls. Okay, Niagara Falls, I, of course, as a wire walker, I fell in love with the idea of Niagara Falls. But n what I didn't like about Niagara Falls is probably what you like about Niagara Falls. I, I eavesdrop on your presentation. You like all the daredevils. I hate that word, daredevil. I do, I do. I love them. My skin crawls, you know. Because again, it's like they, they seem to put... I hate the idea of daredevil and stuntman because they put the risk as, as the, the goal for the performance instead of putting um, the inspiration, the beauty, the mystery. The, you know, it's, it's, it's a thin line. But anyway, no, hold on, hold on, now I finish. They're just completely out of control. What's more beautiful than yes. being completely well, out of control? No, no, no. Well, okay, then, then we are very different. But oh. anyway, so... I discover all the daredevil and a lot of wire walkers, okay? There was Blondin in 1859, right. a French guy on a, on a three-inch uh, diameter um, uh, hemp rope from Italy. And I am the biographer of Blondin. I am the historian of wire walking. When I will be 95, I will write the, the Bible, the history of wire walking. So I know all those things. I arrive to Niagara Falls, and I cannot believe it. It's a, uh, well, I cannot say it's a circus. It's very... Uh, insulting for the circus, but um, I could say it's like a Las Vegas thing. You know what they do at night? They put pink and green projector to make the, the falls beautiful. But I think that's it's gorgeous. Like, it's like uh, uh, hammering a little sign saying tree to a beautiful tree. <laughs> I mean, so, so anyway, um, I had, a, okay, but you know what? Uh, here I'm, me, no, yeah, no, no, wait, 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 I love Las I Vegas, finished, the circus. Yes, yes, okay. stop, stop one second. I finished quickly 
this. So then, of course, after saying all that, since I am Mr. Contradiction, I start making models and working on a mile, um, almost a mile long, to put a wire where no human being even th would think of doing, which is not above the horseshoe or the American fall, but above both. Uh, My wire will, will fly above the entire Niagara Fall complex. But then I realize, that, that this place is a Las Vegas uh, growing place, and, it's, and then, of course, the, the game of the permission and all that, and then I got tired of the idea. So, to answer your question now, in a, in a nutshell, is the canyon, which is called Canyon Walk, an opera in a Grand Canyon, mm -hmm. is still alive in a little box of project not yet dead, yeah. but, you know, uh, life is, is, is passing by, I'm getting very old, um, but I'm still practicing three hours a day, and I'm still going around the world, walking on the Y and street juggling and doing all those things. And then Niagara Falls is something that I abandon because of the, the grotesque uh, appearance of the fall and what human beings have done to this area. And also, uh, really, you know, putting your life in a barrel and hoping to survive. It's not a great lesson for young human beings to grow with. Um, but anyway, we don't have to Well, a lot of them spend a lot of time constructing we, their barrel. They put their cat the in the barrel and then pushed it off the foot. Okay, we, we can go to their a bar and we can alive. fight about, okay. <laughs> you know, daredevil versus uh, profound uh, artistry. But, um, <laughs> but let's, let's okay, engage let's go. the audience. You like red wine. Um, yes, vodka. Uh, Elizabeth, you Sir. are the keeper of, of the time. Do I'm, we have time to, to we have We are a, going out to okay. the audience right now. Great. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Uh, it's a pleasure to see the two of you together. Uh, in my opinion, you're both tricksters. <laughs> the um, Native Americans in Taos, New Mexico, have tricksters. It's part of their tradition. And I'd like to know, in my opinion, civilization's goal is to destroy the trickster in every child. Can you tell me <laughs> what happened when was your existential confrontation within yourself that you decided not to give up your trickster? Well, it's a beautiful question. And um, by the way, in the uh, American Indian tradition of some of those tribes, uh, and, and they have painting in a caves to show it, they are a kind of medicine man, magician. And there is one that actually walks on a line, uh, you know, an Im probably imaginary line with his arm across. But um, the uh, the, the answer should be never. She should never give up. Um, okay, I, I tell you, I, I, and it's so ridiculous, I don't even know the author of that, but here is a little 10-second uh, uh, dialogue. Um, go to the edge. Uh, we can't. We, we're afraid. Go to the edge. Oh, we can't. We're going to fall. And they went to the edge. And he pushed them. And they flew. So if you say that to six years old, they're going to remember that little story all their life. And it just means that do not look at the sign, do not walk on the grass, you know. Do, walk on, on exactly where it says do not walk. That's where you have to venture. I'm not saying become a criminal like me, a pickpocket at 18 years old, um, putting wires illegally everywhere. That's really a nonsense. But I am saying break the rules or actually ignore the rules because when you ignore the rules, it's much easier to break them, actually. And the, the answer of this existentialist question is every day of your life, every moment, you know, feel yourself living. Somebody asks you a question, question the question. Why are you asking me that? You know, it's much more interesting than formulating an answer. So I don't know, but be, be yourself. Again, I am, not, I am not a guru selling recipes. I am a, a madman trying to make sense of this very short little life. And actually, I cannot make sense. That's why I live in the clouds. Um, I think it's when I burned my parents' barn down. <laughs> <laughs> it was just so exciting. Um, first of all, Elizabeth, uh, uh, one of my best friends, their kids danced in one of your shows here in L.A. like 15 years wow. ago, and now they're wow. like in their 20s, I think. And um, for both of you, uh, do you feel a sense of responsibility uh, to what you show to children, because children respond, I think, to, to uh, both of your work. I, I do, we've asked, like, what is our civic responsibility for the invention and transference of action and movement? And I do believe what I said to Mr. Obama, um, which is that um, you know, it, it's a panacea for change. And if everyone did just get up and bounce around a little like that, um, it would stop everything that's bad. 
and certainly starting with the kids, mostly because also they move so erratically and wildly. I'm spending a whole lot of time stealing their moves. So it's a two-way street. And we have about and 350 kids at SLAM, so come on over. And your kids, too, so, I mean, so you are children. Now I jump in because it was a question that was to both of us. And personally, I, f I, I fear the, the word, when I hear responsibility, I, I cross the street. Because um, responsibility, again, should not be a law, should not be, it should be something that comes naturally, humanly in life. So when I meet a child, uh, if, uh, if I do a magic trick or if, uh, you know, I, uh, wh whatever, um, as a performer, to try to answer your question, I think it's completely wrong, but that's my, my belief, to try to to establish a, a responsible, a, a link with the audience. And many mm, show business performers, you know, they have a, when they're being applauded, they, they make more applaud, or they make people laugh, or they, they do all those little tricks of the trade that we have seen for centuries, but they are not real, they're not themselves. And you can see in two seconds, without having been to any art school, who is the true artist and who is the faker. And I think my responsibility as an artist, and I'm probably for the first time in my life I'm using that word, um, is actually to completely deny that subject and to do something that might find a little bit strange, but instead of engaging the audience and trying to please them, trying to frighten them like they do in the circus, I am just going to throw at the people, my audience, I am going to throw to them something mad the image of a man prisoner of his passion, prisoner of his word, and be a uh, street juggling or magic or on a high wire or anything, I, I am I, I'm not, uh, the audience doesn't exist, but well, of course they do. And what I do is I try to show my world, and that's the most strong way to not impress, you see, but to inspire, much more important than inspress. Because if you see somebody doing a little show business uh, extravaganza to, to make you laugh and applause, okay, fine. But if you see somebody, let's say a juggler, in a circle of light, completely prisoner of the ball and showing he or her personality, well, you, four years old or 94 years old, you're gonna remember all your life. I saw this amazing person, the light went dark, and he, I don't know, he was prisoner of his balls, three white balls, and it was like, he was in the moon, we didn't exist, but he, he, we were allowed to, to peek in his, to enter in his world or her world. So that I think should be, and it, it's my responsibility as an artist, is to not think of the audience and not work toward the audience, but work toward a sincere presentation of, of my world. And I think if I am really strong and sincere, you're gonna see a very strong performance and you're gonna be inspired. It was too long of an answer, but. Well, I actually think, I actually think, and this is what I think is so um, dangerous about modern dance, is what if what the audience, including all of you, really want to do is do it and not watch it? Is movement meant to watch or do? Did someone over here? You? This isn't quite formulated, but uh, is, there any, um, is there any change in your philosophy over time? Like you mentioned that you're getting, you, you might be, you're like approaching a point where you couldn't do the canyon walk physically? Is that No, true? no, actually, no. you know what, this idea, another thing that enraged me is the idea of getting old. How ridiculous. I mean, I see teenagers with a stupid little blueberry, boysenberry and all that, <laughs> and, they, and they drag their feet through life and they're dead already. And I see 90 years old carpenter who is still, you know, working barefoot outside and building a barn. Uh, I said that because I just built a barn and my last book, my book number eight, <laughs> is called uh, A Square Peg, coming out soon. But anyway, no, age, and this is not exactly your question, but I want to, to change your question, is that... Believe, um, you don't, age, that's off the rules. No, 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 no. But age is, is a ridiculous notion. And, and by the way, no, I'm going to answer your question, is I am 61 no years old, and uh, how do I feel about walking the wire? Well, I'm still practicing three hours a day, and very frankly, I'm not, I, I have nothing to sell here, right? And I have nothing to win and nothing to lose by being honest. Uh, and, and, and what it is, is that I am in the best of my mental and physical shape. I will not do the, today the, the somersault that I did as a stupid 18 years old to show off or to learn why walking in 15 days, uh, 15 months, but much better than that, I have spent my entire life practicing walk. I mean, nobody has done that, nobody even thinks. It's like saying, uh, go to school to learn how to breathe, right? I mean, oh, I am in the business of walking. Well, this is totally insane and ridiculous. <laughs> and, 
and and wait, 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 don't, don't, uh, oh. uh, I see you move out there, but oh, don't sorry, interrupt me. Um, I'm peripatetic, I can't yeah, help yeah, it. Yeah, 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 no, because, hold on, where was I? I lost my wire. So walk, uh, walk, you're walking. Oh, yes. Um, Oh, yes, yes, yes. So now I have a lifetime behind me of knowledge and all that. And I start a tiny bit to know the wire, to know the sky, to, to know what, what it takes to, to walk. And I couldn't do that at the beginning of my life as an impatient uh, little tenacious uh, teenager who wanted to prove himself. So in a way, um, not age, but ex experience, not a word that I hate because, you know, believe my experience and what if you were wrong all your life? I don't want to hear your <laughs> thing. But anyway, no, it's, it is to say that if your heart is young, your body is a little detail. You're, you have to drag your body by the sleeve without asking your body its advice. Of course, at some point in life, your body will say, I give up and you cannot drag me anymore. At that moment, if you have good friends, true friends, they will say, hey, Philip, get off the wire. You look ugly, you look old. It's a, it's a pity to look at, at you on the wire, okay? But until that moment arrives, until your body scream for, hey, hey, stop, stop, look at me, I cannot function anymore, then everything is possible. And, and anyway, I don't know if I answer your question, it doesn't matter, but I, <laughs> I took your question to say that, so. Um, Leap, you're supposed to answer the questions. Yeah. Do we still have time? Uh, yes. Because I, I have another five, six hours here. Well, oh. science, <laughs> science, I mean, given that scientists, including particle physicists, have still not defined time, they go, there's something weird about the minus sign. I, I think, basically, we can be here for a little longer. Are there, is there a mic to this person? Are you okay, Philippe? Are you yes, yes, but I hope some questions are directed to you. I'm not the Don't star worry. here. Don't worry. I, I answer them in my mind anyway. Philippe. Philippe, yeah. Philippe um, could you address uh, trust in, the, in, in how you believe and how, and how you think in terms of everybody else questioning life I and, think and art that in, in a different way? Yes, you know, trust. And I, I, I constantly, when I do lecture to university, I constantly say, and this is not taught in schools, and this is not taught in school. And I have, you know, students in front of me, and in the back I have the trembling teachers. Say, what the hell is he telling my students? But I think, we, you know, there should be course in school about pickpocket, the art of the pickpocket, okay? This is my seventh book, uh, only in French at the moment, but uh, it's going to be in English soon. So, um, because uh, there they should, be, um, they should be courses in mistakes. Tuesday, 9 a.m., come, we're going to make mistakes, right? And you're going to learn from your mistakes. I mean, what, that, this is very important. There should be a course in intuition, because to me, as a person who did not learn other than by myself, I had to follow my intuition. Certainly, I didn't want to follow the, the, the normal way of thinking. So now we're talking about intellectual risk. To follow your intuition is to throw yourself in a direction, to fall flat on your face because <laughs> it was the wrong direction. Try the next direction tomorrow. But intuition, there should be courses in our university about intuition. Follow your intuition. You have a big problem you don't know. Fine. What do you think? Well, I think it has to do with the molecules. And, okay, good, good, go there, and you're going to get the Nobel Prize, you know? So intuition is there, intellectual courage. Um, daydreaming, there should be courses in daydreaming, okay? Put your pencil in your mouth, put your feet on the desk, and, and fly away, yeah? And, and um, it, all those things, uh, I, I forgot the question again, but no, trust, trust, that was a beautiful word. So you know what? The word trust, I will reverse it. I will write it on the mirror. I will look at it every morning. Trust yourself. You know, and, and be, be crazy, make, make, make a fool of yourself. That's the second time I say that tonight, uh, because I'm a fool. But that was a very nice question. Tori, uh, do we have a mic down here? Um, I think this will be the last question. Is that true? From the owners um, and operators of the Hammer Museum. Can we make two? Two, yes. One for me, one for you. Well, this one, this one's for Elizabeth, oh. um, and it's so interesting to look at the two of you up there in your black and white. Black and white. But, um, black and uh, white. I yeah. actually yeah. think you guys are a lot more similar. Uh, I know you love the um, en risk enough, of enough, what enough. you do, but you, I don't think, I, I think probably the experimentation of what you do is pretty risky, but once you got it going, you, you know what you're doing. There's not a lot of room for error up there once you're, once you're doing what you're doing. Um, even though I wouldn't do it, but when you're doing it and your followers are doing it, 
they know what they're doing. And um, uh, I, I could see if you aren't careful, you might sprain your arm or, you know, bump your head. But, you know, you're not trying to do that and you are, you are, you know, I mean, it seems to me that once you know what you're doing, you, you know exactly what you're doing like he knows what he's so doing. So what is your question? <laughs> um, actually, it's not a question. Do you um, really, th it's not always a risk. I um, mean, well, most of the injuries happen when we're inventing and exploring on the new uh, set of equipments and in the turbulences and conditions I've uh, designed. But really, things go wrong all the time because my constructions are not about predictability. My instructions are about, <gasps> you don't want that to happen. <laughs> what would happen is all of a sudden, my feet would be where my knees are right now. No, just joking. Um, so that the idea of creating a non-predictive structure temporally and physically is really what Streb does choreographically. Um, and that's why we can't dance to music and all of that. So that allows for a certain amount of risk. And you know, yeah, hopefully not terrible accidents, but we've had a couple. But. I think this has been just tremendous. And uh, will you please help me welcome both the Hammer Museum and Philippe Petit. Um, are you good? I want, I want to say, <laughs> I want to say bye bye in a, in a form of a little experiment. I am obviously a, in quest of perfection every day of my life. Perfection, another thing to have courses of in our schools, and it's many people, hundreds, million people can balance something on their nose. Many jugglers do that. But what's impossible is to bring the balance to zero, to nothing, to absence of movement uh, for a fraction of a second. And uh, I'm not going to spend hours doing that. I'm going to spend five seconds. I will win or I will fail. But if you can see through the, the real time and space, you might see this flower completely on my nose unmoving for a eighth of a second. And that is a pure miracle that I would like to leave you with, and I might fail. So you cover me if I fail. Huh? What, if, what You'll if, say something. I won't. What if I, um, do you want me to help you? No, just in case I fail. OK, so hold on. It's moving. It's balancing. And now, hold on, I bring it. Did you see it? Yes, I saw it. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>